So hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. We are Tunis Our User Group. We are a very nice group. So the idea of building this community uh, came to us when uh, we were like three ladies really passionate about our programming, me, Hediat Nani, bioinformatician and data analyst, uh, Amal Tlili, data science engineer, and uh, Mune Belaid, business uh, intelligence consultant. And we uh, wanted to have a community where everyone could learn about programming and make it easier, you know, for people from low income countries to learn about like, how to build pipelines, how to uh, make and develop packages, and you know, everything related to R. Uh, after, after that, so my colleague, uh, Amal, uh, Amal Bukteb, uh, an aspiring bioinformatician joined us, and we are together organizing the bioinformatics event, co-organizing. Actually, we had many uh, events that we posted on our YouTube channel, and feel free, we will send you the link. So uh, if you're curious about our previous uh, like uh, events and workshops, uh, please yeah, feel free to subscribe to our channel. So the code of conduct of uh, Tunis Arusa Group is dedicated to providing a respectful, harassment-free community for everyone. We do not tolerate harassment or bullying of any community member in any form. And please let's keep this place, you know, welcoming and friendly community a place for everyone to learn together and to enjoy learning together. Uh, as I said, so we have our YouTube channel where we post our uh, previous uh, workshops. And today we have the honor to uh, have with us Dr. Bruno Andre Rodriguez Coelho uh, to learn about how to build reproducible analytical pipelines uh, with R. So let's uh, introduce our guest. So thank you so much, Bruno, for accepting our uh, invitation. Uh, Dr. Bruno Andre Rodriguez Coelho is an economist and statistician working at the Luxembourg Ministry of Higher Education and Research. He is also the author of the book, Building Reproducible Analytical Pipelines with R. We will send you the link on the chat and please feel free to go there and to this link, you know, uh, to have access to uh, this book. And it's a very, very uh, interesting book, you know, to read and to learn from. Uh, there are so many things, yeah, uh, like uh, accessible and so many tips on how to build uh, reproducible uh, pipelines. He's also the author of the book Modern R with a Tidy Verse. There's also uh, free, you know, it's like access to it uh, in this link. So please, yeah, if you want to learn more about Tidy Verse and about how to build reproducible pipeline, you have the two links here. And before we start, please feel free to ask, you know, it's like uh, questions on the chat and uh, to leave, you know, after that uh, or to get, we will be really happy uh, to get uh, your feedback. So, um, yeah. And uh, before, you know, it's like letting our uh, guests starting, uh, we want to thank Epsilon. Uh, they gave us, they sponsored our uh, Zoom, so we are really grateful for that. And uh, we really, you know, it's like advise you to visit their blog and YouTube channel, where you can find lots of tutorial about shiny dashboards, data science, machine learnings, our open source uh, community news, and so many, so many, you know, interesting information to start with R and to learn, you know, it's like new things, yeah, about R. Yeah. So I will stop sharing my screen and Bruno, please, the screen is yours. And thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the, uh... The very nice introduction and the opportunity also that you give me tonight or today, depending on your time zone, I guess, um, of talking about uh, 
reproducible pipelines. So uh, I put the links in the chat, but I, I will show them here again. Um, the slides are available on, on the link that you see uh, over here. So is good and then uh, wraps rug tunis. And the, all the code that I'm, that I'm going to show you, absolutely everything, is also on this GitHub here, uh, wraps rug tunis. So you will find everything that I'm going to show you. So if you don't follow everything and you won't be able to follow because I'm going to show a lot of things rather quickly, uh, no worries. The code is there, and if you have questions, you know, just open an issue on the on the GitHub or send me an email or whatever. Uh, you'll have my contacts at the end, and uh, we can we can talk about it. So um, let's let's get right to it. Um, the goal of this workshop is I, I won't be able to teach you uh, everything in great detail because you only have two hours. However, uh, I think once you will leave this workshop, you will you should be able to identify. What you, what you must manage for reproducibility, for reproducibility, so how to make a project reproducible. Um, and I will quickly show you some of the tools that you can use to turn your projects reproducible. First of all, I'm going to talk about RENV, I'm going to talk about targets, and I'm going to talk about Docker. I have to leave certain things out because, again, we only have two hours. Um, I will not talk about functional programming concepts, which are not strictly necessary for reproducibility, but it's useful. The, it's, functional programming has some useful ideas that make, your, that make it easier to turn your projects reproducible. I will also not talk about Git and GitHub, but um, because there's, there are many resource, resources about that and uh, we don't have enough time, but I really urge you if you are not familiar with Git and GitHub, to, to, you know, to get to learn these tools because they're really very, very useful and um, they make your life so much easier. Uh, and well, this uh, you don't see it very well here, but I will also not talk about documenting and testing and packaging code, which is also, strictly speaking, not necessary, but it's useful. You know, if you, if you know how to document and to test and package code, it makes things easier and it helps reproducibility, obviously. But again, we don't have time for everything. Um, so the main reference of this workshop is, um, as uh, was also already stated, is uh, this free book that I, I wrote, Building Reproducible Analytical Pipelines with R. You can read it for free online. Uh, you can buy a DRM free copy if you want on LeanPub. You can buy a paper book uh, on Amazon. But you can read it for free as well. So feel free to just you know, go there. And it's exactly the same content. It's not like the free version is, is uh, less detailed or anything. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, you can even download the PDF that gets used to, to print the book if you want. It's all in the, on the GitHub repository. Um, let me also, before continuing, really define what I mean by reproducibility. Um, I'm really talking about recovering exactly the same results uh, from an analysis, or, all right? So I'm not, I'm not talking about just being able to run some code um, on maybe some new data or things like that, but I, I really want to get exactly the same results uh, from an analysis. If I run this analysis 10 times, I need to get the same results 10 times. And you know, the question is, why would you want that? Why is that even useful? Because you could think, and you know, I get, I get asked this sometimes, and it's a, it's a very legitimate question. You know, if you run your analysis, you have your results, you know, why bother with trying to make it reproducible, right? And well, there's maybe auditing purposes. So this is something, depending on your industry, that can happen. You, you just get asked, you know, to rerun the code and to, you know, verify the results by some auditing, uh, external or internal to your company. Uh, and if the data gets updated, if you do get an update of the data, and you rerun your analysis, you rerun your pipeline, then you want the differences in the results to only come from that updated data and not somehow to come from, you know, because the computational environment changed or because you updated your packages and now all of a sudden, you know, the, the results are different. So you, you only want the update of the data to, to be the source, let's say, of the difference. And then, of course, if you're in science, and I guess that might be the case for at least some of you, if you're, you know, if you're a scientist, then you know, reproducibility is a cornerstone, cornerstone of science. So you know, your your experiment, your analysis should be uh, reproducible, right? And you know, something I won't really mention, but uh, that you might also want to consider is to actually work on an immutable development environment. So that's an in development environment that you cannot change, that you cannot update. 
Um, and you can do so, for example, from a Docker container or, you know, there's other solutions, but uh, usually Docker is probably the most popular one. And that's also a way that you can, you know, ensure that everyone on your team, for example, if they're working on the same environment, then, you know, everyone gets the same results. Or, or if they don't, then it's because there's a mistake somewhere and it's not because the environment is different. And the question then becomes, well, you know, if I have the original script and data, right, you know, what's the problem? Why, why can't I necessarily get the same results 10 times if I run this, the original script with the original data? I use that and I just run my, my pipeline 10 times, 100 times. Why don't why can it happen that I don't get the same result? What, what's the problem? And actually, there are different things that you need to consider. Um, the first thing is that you have to realize that reproducibility is on a certain form of continuum. And uh, let me explain what I mean by that. And it's not, you know, it's not my original idea, but something that, is, uh, that comes in the literature. So you need to manage the version of R that gets used. Okay, you need to think about this because a new version of R can sometimes introduce some changes that make your code behave in different ways and produce different results. You also have to manage and think about versions of packages that you use, right? You have to think about your operating system. It's not necessarily something that you know, a lot of people think about. And the hardware. I won't talk about the hardware because that's very specific and it's not something that I think happens too often to too many people, but this can also be an issue. So this idea of reproducibility being on a continuum, I, the first reference I found, but maybe there are older ones, uh, but the first I found is uh, from uh, Roger Peng from 2011, uh, from this paper called Reproducible Research in Computational Science. And the idea is that if you only have the publication, okay, if you only have the report, right, with, with the tables and the graphs, or if you only have a, a research paper and it's written, it's done, and if you only have that, then that's not reproducible. Like, the, it's just not, right? If you add to this publication, if you add code, that's already better. You can, you know, at least look at the code, maybe, you know, run that on some, you know, uh, synthetic data or things like that. But it's not great. But it's already better than just having the paper. If you add the code and the original data, that's even better. And then if you add to the code and the data, if you add the, uh, they call it here, the linked and execu executable code and data, if you add basically the computational environment, then that's better. That's like the gold standard. All right. Um, do we have some questions? I hear, I hear uh, uh, a mic maybe. Is there a question or not yet? Okay, great. So I will sometimes, you know, switch back to the uh, to, to the to the chat just to make sure that there are no questions. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat. So here is some example of uh, you know different R versions producing different results. Uh, if you look at this code over here, and if you set the seed to one, two, three, four, and you look at this code in the versions of R that came before 3.6, you would get the sequence 26589. And if you use the same seeds with the same code, but on R that came after 3.6 or including 3.6, then you get 106541. And that has a real impact on papers published before with these older versions. And actually, I, I worked these past weeks on a, on a research project with a colleague. Um, I'm not a researcher anymore, but sometimes I still contribute a little, and uh, and we've wrote something where we were trying to reproduce a, a study, and because of this change, the results are different, and that's actually you know not very good for the results because the seeds should not really impact the results, um, but but in, it does in this case it does, and uh, you know it highlights that not only you know you have to think about the version of R, but maybe the identification strategy that was used by the original authors is not that robust because if the seeds you know changes your results dramatically, then, you know, maybe something uh, worse than just the version of R is going on. Uh, if you look at packages, I think this is the classical one that a lot of people uh, have trouble with. You know, there's some update from some package, and now all of a sudden something doesn't work. Here I have one example, but there are many others. Um, this is a stringer package uh, with the function string a subset. This code before stringer version 1.5, returned the string A, the character A. The same code after Stringer 1.5 
results in an error. And actually, that is a good change. It should return an error, right? Um, the problem is that, you know, if your old code relied on that old behavior, if somewhere in your script you use that, <laughs> sorry, if somewhere in your script you use that and, you know, re you relied on that behavior, now this is not going to work. It's not going to work anymore uh, if you update Stringer. The operating systems, you know, another risk to mitigate. Uh, as I said, this is rarely an issue, but it can happen. For example, in this paper by uh, Newpen uh, at, at all from 2019, uh, this is a paper in chemistry, so I'm not a chemist, so I, you know, I, I don't understand uh, what they're doing. But what was interesting from this paper is that they tried to reproduce some results from an older study, and they had everything. They had the, the code, they had the data, they knew uh, that you know which versions of the software they were they were using, so they used the same software. So it was uh, built on Python here in this case. So they used the same version of Python. They used the same version of the Python packages. Everything was the same, and yet they were having different results. And they had different results depending on the operating system that they were using. So. Uh, on Linux, or, so on Ubuntu 16.04, I guess, or 16.10, they had these results. On Windows version 10, they had different results, not very different, but still different. On Mac OS Mavericks, they had the same results than on Windows 10, but on Mac OS Mojave, they had different results, even from the other, diff even from the other Mac OS, right? So that's really surprising. What is going on? Well, it turns out that the pipeline that the original pipeline that they were trying to reproduce, that they were trying to rerun, relied on how the files were uh, sorted on the hard disk. And Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, they sort the files differently. And here they show how Windows sorts some files and then how Linux sorts some files. And basically what was happening is that different weights, so this is what this was like a some kind of weighted mean they were running, something like that. So different weights were applied to the different elements. And the correct weight was applied depending on, you know, to, 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 on, on how the file was sorted. And it turns out that if the files were sorted differently, then you get different results. So, and that was just because of the operating system. So they had to explicitly program, to solve this, they had to explicitly program which weight should be applied to which of the files, right? Uh, so that, you know, was very difficult, I guess, for them to, to realize what was happening, but they did, and then they wrote a paper on it. The, the core of the problem, basically, is that uh, when you write code, it tends to only work on your machine. That's that's the core of the problem. This is something that is well known, like in in uh, software engineering, this works on my of my machine is kind of a meme, and this is the core of the problem. And it turns out that uh, the solution is going to be, we are going to ship your computer then. And we're going to use Docker to ship your computer. And I'm going to show you how. So before I start with like the, the code and the project, do we have questions? Do we have questions uh, in the chat? Or, or maybe you know, if, if you want to turn on your mic or something. So this was a. Introduction, and now we're going into the code. <coughs> no questions, all right. So, uh, do I mean, maybe I will, uh, you know, I, I guess I might increase the font a little bit more uh, because it's not that, it's not that big. Yeah, that should be fine. So I am going to uh, show you um, an analysis very quickly. And I'm going to show you this analysis uh, in the form of scripts, first of all. And then I'm going to make this analysis more and more reproducible. And I'm going to uh, you know, apply some of the techniques that I, that I talked about very quickly in the introduction to make this a reproducible pipeline. So this is uh, a, a script, savedata.r. This script downloads an Excel file. OK, it downloads an Excel, an Excel file. I, I hosted this Excel file uh, on GitHub. And this is, this is like a real Excel file. OK, this is the, from, a, from a real Luxembourgish 
public administration. Okay, this is not something that that is invented. This is like real data. And maybe maybe I could show you real quick uh, how it looks like. Maybe I could show you as well. Uh, yeah, here, here it is. So that's how it looks. So this is this is. Uh, a file that each tab, right? Each tab is a year, and it shows like the average price of housing in Luxembourg, right? And all in and these these are communes. So a commune in Luxembourg is an administrative division. So you know, in the US, it would be equivalent to a county, you know, to the lower administrative division. Uh, in France, it's commune as well. In Belgium as well, I think. So these are you know the lowest administrative divisions, basically. And, um, and this is like real data from the Observatoire de l'Habitat. So this is, this is a, like a, a, an official, you know, public administration, right? And we have this data in this form, which is not great for analysis, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to transform this Excel into a flat file that I can then, you know, use R to, to, to work on. And I write it as a sort of, as a sort of script. <coughs> so basically, I, I start by downloading it. I write this function that reads in the data. And I, you know, I loop over. And I won't comment everything because it's not really important. But I loop over the, all the sheets. And I get the raw data. Right? I, I do some renamings. I rename some, some columns, etc. Uh, and then I, I filter Luxembourg and uh, and I you know and I count certain things. I just look at the spelling because you know sometimes Pétange, for example, uh, let me show you. Sometimes Pétange is written. Maybe I have I don't know if it's yeah. You see this here. It's written with an e, but it should be written with an e accent aigu. So in French the the e accent aigu, but it's not. It should be written like this. So I correct that. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I do like the basic stuff that all of us do when you get data. So you you try to to clean it. You try to put it in a form that you can then analyze it, right? And this is what this script does. So if you run this script, you will get the you know the data um, in a in a form that you can that you can use. What is also quite important is that I want to check so if all the communes are actually in the data. And to do this. I go to Wikipedia and I scrape a table that contains the list of the communes. But because Wikipedia changes and because, you know, in Luxembourg we have, I don't know if this is something that happens often in other countries, but in Luxembourg communes tend to split or they tend to merge relatively often, actually. <laughs> so like every, at, like in, in a time span of 10 years, you will always have at least two communes that merged or maybe that split. So the table can change. So what I did, instead of scraping directly from Wikipedia, what I did is I, I saved the file, right? I saved the page and I re-hosted it on, on GitHub. So I re-hosted the, right, the table. This is the table that I want to scrape with all the communes. And I, you know, I re-hosted it to, you know, to make sure that it's not never going to change now, right? And so that's what I did. So I rehosted and I scrape what I rehosted. Okay. And <coughs> I do this thing. I, I clean the names, I clean the spelling, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I, I see if everything is all right. And if everything is all right, so basically if this set is empty, I have all the communes, you know, all the communes are accounted, I have everything in my data, and I don't have any spelling errors anymore. So these are some tests that I do. And finally. Finally, I write the data sets. I write the data sets, and then I do my analysis. And in my analysis, what I do is I do, you know, I load the data, and I do some, you know, group by, and I filter, and I create new columns. And then at the end, I do a plot. Uh, here's the plot. I do a plot for Luxembourg. So this is like the, so Luxembourg, the country, has also a Luxembourg commune. And the, this commune contains the capital city, which is also called Luxembourg. So it's a bit confusing. There's three levels for Luxembourg. Then I do the same for Esch sur Alzette, which is the second largest city. Then I do the same for Mama. I do the same for Schengen. So Schengen, by the way, this is the, the city that gave the name to the Schengen area because the, the, 
the agreement was signed there. Uh, and I do the same for Vikraj, and I save my plots. And that's it, right? So it's I clean data, I do my, my plots, and I'm happy. Now you know, comes the question, what's the problem with this, right? <laughs> why, why, why do I need more than that? And I will try to convince you that you might need more than that. So let me just go back to the slides, unless we have a question. Unless we have a question, no questions. Don't hesitate to write or to, you know, to, to if you want to turn on your mic now and, and ask something. Do not hesitate. So why do we need more? Uh, so this is basically what I say. So you know everything is explained. You know what's wrong. So that's the question. What's wrong with this script? Why why do we need more? What why is that not reproducible, etc. So <clears throat> we have two scripts. So this is a script-based workflow, and the script-based workflow is you know just a long series of calls. There are no functions. Almost there. I just wrote one. It's very difficult to reuse uh, because there are no functions. Uh, it's very difficult to test. You know, functions are easy to test. This is very difficult to test. It's very difficult to parallelize as well. Uh, basically impossible. You need to, if you want to run this in parallel, you need to rewrite everything, basically. Uh, there are lots of re repetitions, right? The plots at the end, you know, I, I write exactly the same code five times, okay, because I'm not using functions. Um, and, you know, what we want usually at the end, is a, some kind of report. It's not really the script it, itself, right? It's a report, or you know, it's maybe some type, some type of other, you know, data product could be a trained machine learning model or something. But usually, you, the, the script itself is not really what interests you, right? It's what it produces that interests you. Here, we also have like no record of R versions or package versions. We only know the packages, right? Because we we put them here, right at the top. That's that's fine, we have them here, but we don't have any versions. We don't know, you know, what versions of ggplot and dplyr, uh, et cetera, right? So, you know, that's a big problem because if I want to rerun these two scripts in five years, you know, maybe they're going to work, maybe not. And, you know, and these are quite simple and, and short scripts, but the longer your project um, and the more complex, then, you know, the more likely it is that you will have some problems rerunning everything down the line. So how do we turn these scripts reproducible? And essentially, it's answering these questions. How easy would it be for someone else to rerun the whole analysis, right? Um, if you put yourself in someone else's shoes, how easy would it be for that person to rerun your analysis? Maybe it's easy enough, so you know that's fine. Or maybe it's not that easy, and uh, you know that could be a problem for reproducibility, of course. You know, how easy would it be to update the project? For example, if you know I, I, I some some communes merge and I get new data or whatever, how easy would it be to just rerun the whole thing on a new Excel? You know, because the source uh, is this Excel. You know, if I get a new Excel, would it how just how easy would it be to update everything, right? How easy would it be to reuse the code that I wrote for another project? And you know, in this case, because I don't use many functions or any, it would not be that easy. And you know, what guarantee do we have that the output is stable through time? So this is, you know, what do we have a guarantee? And you could say, well, you know, I I, I don't need a guarantee, and that's fine. But if you don't have a guarantee, then you know. Maybe in five years, in six months, whenever, this is not going to run anymore. <laughs> and you know, if you're fine living with this uh, risk, then fine. But you, ideally, it's much better with a guarantee. And it's the same for all these four questions, right? You could choose to not care about question two, for example, because maybe you are 100% sure that this is will be, this analysis will be a one shot. But uh, or maybe you don't care about you know the tree because you think that this project is so specific that you will never use any codes for another project. That's fine. I mean, this, this is up to you, and this is also why reproducibility is on a continuum. But ideally, you would need to answer the four questions with some 
positive, you know, arguments and with some tools that help you answer this question to make sure that everything is easy to rerun, is easy to update, is easy to reuse, and that the outputs are stable through time. And this is what I'm going to show you. So before he, this, do we have questions or reactions or something? Uh, yes, I see something. The data cleaning steps need to be manually checked every time based on the, the input data. Yeah, I mean, because exactly, yeah, we don't have any tests really. I mean, the only test that, that we have here is, uh, you know, whether or, or not we have the communes, but that's it, right? And of course, you know, if you if you would write more tests, that's, that's much better, definitely. So if you get updates, you know, you, you know, well, uh, here's something wrong, here's something new in the data, etc. for sure, yeah. Do we have other questions? OK, let's continue. So the cheapest thing and the easiest thing that you can do, I think, I believe, is uh, just to generate a list of used packages using RMV. I think that's probably the easiest thing that you could do. So I'm not even saying that you should use RMV like on a daily basis. But at the end of a project, you know, once you deliver it, just create an RN log file in two easy steps. First of all, you open an error session that contains all the code of your script, that contains your analysis, and you just run RN init. That's it. And I'm going to do it. So suppose, um, yeah, suppose I have, well, no, let me just, yeah, I think I might not have, but yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay, let me just do it here then. Um, set as working directory. So, you know, I'm done with my I'm done with my, my analysis, right? I have my two scripts, I'm done. And I want to leave a trace of the packages used. So I run rnv init. And I, you know, I just answer yes. And it's rnv is just, you know, discovering the packages, discovering the libraries, it's running for a little bit, and it's going to generate an rnv log file. And, and, and I'm done, basically. You know, if I, if I don't want to use rnv anymore, but I'm, I can leave it at, the, at this, you know. But at least I have this rnv log file now. And what this rnv log file is, this lists the R version. It's a JSON, it's a JSON file, basically, that lists the R version used, and all the packages used as well with their versions, with where they come from, with their requirements, et cetera, et cetera. There's everything there, everything. And why is that useful? That is useful because if I give my project with an RN file, an RN log files, with this log file, if I give that to someone, that person will be able and will be able to simply come here, for example, let me just, so the, imagine this is a new project. I set as a new working. Maybe I need to, ideally, it's better to restart the session. OK. And let me just, what, just let me just, because I need to make sure that I'm in the right folder. Uh, yes, I'm in the right folder. And I have this rnv log file. And now I can run rnv restore. And you know, I get asked if I want to activate the project and so on. I say yes. And now it lists me all the packages, right? It lists me all the packages that were found in the RNV log file. You know, it lists me everything. And I can inspect that and I can say yes. And now what it's going to do is it's going to download the packages, even the old ones. Look, look, this comes from the archive. So these are even the, the old packages get downloaded and they get saved in a project specific library. So basically what this means is that I can then run my project with exactly these packages. Okay. I can run my project with these packages. These packages get downloaded. They don't interfere with the other packages that I have installed on my system. And I can have as many projects using RNV as I want, right? And you can use RNV on a daily basis. So as you as you are working, you you take snapshots, you take new snapshots of your, and you regenerate the RNV log file, 
right? You can do that if you want. So you keep your uh, package library stable with that project, or you can do it as I did it here. You know, you just wanna you just wanna add the R and block file as a deliverable. Basically, you you you're working on your project and you put your scripts online, for example, or you make them you make them available within your company. And you add an R block file, so people know. Okay, these are the packages that were used, and I actually can even restore them. You know, I can I can restore them, and I can run that analysis with the right packages. Okay, so this I think is really the, the easiest thing that you can do. Um, and we you know, R and Vinic. Yes. We have some questions in the chat. Ah, oh, great. Yeah, maybe it's a nice moment. Yeah. Uh, so can we start a script in a new R project? So by default, everything. Yeah, you can use projects. So I do, I'm not using here. Uh, I'm not using projects here because I'm just like showing you. Um, you know, I, and I, I have to move from one, you know, from one uh, script to the other. But if you use projects with R Studio, that works even better because you don't need to set the working directory. So yeah, definitely use projects if you're using R Studio. Um, uh, yeah, so um, that's so much better than a session info. Yeah, because you know a session info just tells you, you know, what the packages that were loaded, right, uh, at the time, but you know they don't. It doesn't allow you to to restore them, right? So with R and it does. Uh, so how far would be would the here package be helpful in transferability of the project instead? Oh yeah, definitely. So. Uh, here is a package that um, you know makes it easier to like set the working directories and so on, and this is especially useful if you are collaborating and like if the data uh, is on, on some on, you know on, if you have the data on your laptop and then you know that you have a, a a laptop specific path and then your coworker has also a copy of the data but of course you know on his laptop or on her laptop it's you know it's uh, hers you know laptop specific path so here is a package that allows you to deal with that. So that's definitely something that you, you could also add to your toolbox, yeah. Uh, because, you know, setting the working directory as, I, as I'm doing it now is actually not very good practice, and it's definitely not good for reproducibility. Again, I'm just doing it here to, you know, just quickly go from one example to the next, uh, but definitely dealing with paths is something that you, you definitely need to think about, yeah. And, you know, here, or, you know, our studio projects are some nice tools for that. Um, yes. So our end, you know, it needs to take some time. You know, the log file, uh, it looks as I, I showed you. So it's this JSON file. It also lists the version of R, okay? But it doesn't restore it, right? It doesn't restore the version of R. It just shows it, which is already not bad, but, you know, it doesn't reinstall R for you, right? Um, so to restore it, you know, you you just run R and restore. It's basically what I showed you. Um, and you have this example that you can try. It will take some time to run because you know the the, the packages are getting downloaded and installed. Uh, but sometimes, as I say, yeah, it might not even work. And I think, yep, I think yeah, it doesn't even work. And there is a good reason for that. And um, and uh, I mean, there can be many reasons for that. But probably uh, what is happening is that the version of Mass that I want to install. Is a bit old, right? And because it's a bit old, I need to compile it from source, okay? There is no pre-compiled package that I can download now. And to compile it from source, I need development libraries, and I don't have these development libraries installed. And so mass fails. So, you know, RNV is not a miracle solution, uh, okay? So sometimes it can fail. And if you don't have the right version of R, you have still have the problem that you you may have the right packages, but you don't have the right version of R. And so, what I'm going to this is why we're going to to go to the next step, which will be using Docker, because Docker will allow you to you know have the right version of R and have the right version of the development libraries, and you know you're going to be able to to you know use R and uh, very efficiently. And actually, as far as I know. There is a new version of RN you know, coming in the future. I don't know exactly when they will be ready with this feature, but they are trying to integrate the PAC package with RN. And PAC 
is a package that allows you to install other packages, like it's a package manager if you want. But what is nice with Pack is it allows you. So, so when you, so for example, if I want to install Mass with Pack, it will also install the underlying development libraries that I need. Okay, and so basically, what this means is that in the future, Rend will not only install the R packages, but will also look at the um, development libraries that you need and will also install them for you. So this type of problem in the future should not happen. Um, but again, Docker will, will be very helpful here to, to deal with that. And I'm going, you know, again, to explain to you. Uh, no questions in the chat, so let's go. <clears throat> um, I think this slide that I have here now is basically what I just told you. So yeah, it records, but does not restore the version of R. Um, installation of packages can fail, as I said, you know, due to missing OS dependencies, development libraries, and so on. But generating this file is basically free. You know, just write rm in it, and you get it. And this gives it provides us with a blueprint for Dockerizing our pipeline. So if we have that file, we can always look at the version of R that was used, get a Docker image with the right version. And you know, add the development libraries that we need, and reinstall all the packages using R and restore. So you know, we always have this option, right? And that person that is going to do that work does not necessarily need to be you. It can be someone else, right? If I want to reproduce a, re uh, a study, for example, you know, the, the, the original researcher or the original author uh, will not be involved. But at least if I have R and you know, I can, I can, you know, I can do my reproducibility study, right? Um, and then you know what is also nice with RMV is if you use it on a day-to-day -day basis, you have project-specific libraries. So you can have like an old version of ggplot for one project, maybe a newer version of ggplot, you know, or, or dplyr or whatever. So you, this can be very useful as well. So let's take a little break and look at where are we in the continuum. So we have packages and R versions that are recorded. So that's pretty nice. We have packages that can be restored, but not always. As I showed you, you know, sometimes it fails. And uh, we still don't have a pipeline, however. You know, where's the pipeline? That because this talk is about building reproducible pipelines, so where is it? We're going to write a pipeline using the targets package. So target is a package for R, and it's a so-called build automation tool. So let's go to, I'm going to show you an example. So if you go to targets pipeline final, uh, yeah, I'm going to show you how it looks. Uh, maybe I won't be able, oh, but I thought, ah, no, sorry. This is because I'm in the, um, yeah, I, I just need to, to set again, you know, the, ex the working directory. Again, this is not the best practice, but. Uh, it just to quickly, yeah, and I restart my session, and now I should should be fine. Now it should be fine. Okay, so basically I have here this uh, folder structure. This is a target you know, project, if you want. What is the difference from before? So uh, I need to remove this. So the difference is that Maybe you know what? Maybe let me just no. You know what? Let, let's let me just talk about about this. So the difference is that I have this targets.r script. Okay, that's the first difference. Before I had the save data.r and I had analyze.r. Now I have this targets.r and what is that? So this script defines a pipeline. So let's not look at what comes first here. Let's just look at this list. So this is a list of target objects, OK? This is a list of target objects. And each target object you know, defines an output as the result of some function call. So for example, country level data is the output of, make, of the function make country level data on flat data, OK? And commune level data is the output of um, make commune level data evaluated on flat data, okay? And so I get this. And this whole thing is a target. And basically, I define my targets like this. I define each of my objects like this. 
And at the end, you know, I render, so this is not a target as such, but now I can render an RMD file. And this RMD file is actually the analysis. It's actually what I want. This is actually the data product that I want. So if you remember, before I told you, you know, you, you don't really want the script in the end, right? You, you want probably some kind of report or maybe a trained machine learning model that you want to, you know, deploy behind an API, or you want maybe a cleaned data set that you are going to load into a database or something like that, right? So you don't really want the script. And so it's nice if you have a pipeline that basically returns you know, the product. And so let's take a look, a, a look visually at the pipeline. So if I load targets and if I run tar viz network, I can now visualize the network. Okay, and so this is actually a visual representation of my pipeline. So if I zoom in, I can see that flat data, for example, is the result of raw data evaluated on clean raw data. Okay, and I can I can find my my uh, you know I can find them here. This is raw data. This is flat data. That is the output of clean raw data, etc. And I get the commune level data. And I get a country level data, so I can be, you know, I can click on all these things, and I can see, okay, how the data flows, and where are the outputs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what is also nice is I can see which, how, which, what is independent. So, for example, this thing, you know, get current communes and the current communes, and this thing, these are completely independent from the rest of the pipeline, which means the target is able to see what are the independent parts of my pipeline and can also then run them very easily in parallel. So this is a, a very interesting feature of targets. And here I see I even have functions that I don't even use, okay? I don't even use in this pipeline directly, okay? And this is also interesting uh, because it allows you to, you know, maybe detect something that maybe you could uh, delete um, and so on. Now, let me, before running the pipeline, let me just uh, show you, uh, for example, you know, clean raw data, right? W where does that come from, right? Or, or uh, get former communes. These are functions, where are they defined? So basically, they're defined in these scripts over here that I just source, okay? Uh, so if I go here, I have here my, my scripts. And if I look at them, you know, I can see, okay, this is my function clean raw data, and this is my function get current communes, and so... I can now read the source code and understand what is going on. So which is nice with something like a targets a pipeline is that I can start by having a very high level look at the pipeline. I can read the pipeline. I can you know, look at the visual representation. There's even another function that is interesting. It's called tar manifest. I can look uh, at in a, in, a, you know, in, a, in a tabular form, I can look at, you know, these are the outputs, and this is the command that produces this, etc. So I can even read it like this if I want. I can look at my graphs, right? I can do all of this, and then if I really want to understand, you know, how make country level data works, I can then go to my scripts and I can read the source code of the functions. And this is, I think, very interesting when you compare to a script-based workflow. You have like a thousand line scripts and it's everything all at once, right? You have all your code is there, right? And um, you can also, you know, you could structure it in a way, in a similar way where you have, you know, uh, your, your script that sources other files. You could do that, but that's somehow rarely the case. Like I, I, I rarely see people working this way. So, you know, maybe I wasn't lucky, but targets forces you to work like that. And I think this is nice that you are forced to really, you know, write these functions. You, you have to use functions. You don't have a choice, right? So you have to use these functions, and so it forces you to work that way. What you could also do is instead of, of sourcing scripts, you could actually package this, and, and this is what you see here. Actually, these are, this is code that is ready to get packaged. These are, these are uh, Roxygen comments. So if I create my package now, uh, and I have these uh, comments here, I will get documentation for free. I'm not going to, to show you this because, again, we only have two hours. But in the, in the book, actually, what uh, I do is that I package this code. And instead of sourcing 
the scripts, I actually load my package. I just load the package from GitHub. That's not an issue. I install it from GitHub, I load it, and then you know I have these functions that are available to me. Finally, the last thing I want to show you before running the pipeline is how you actually load packages that are used within the pipeline. So you load it this way, and the only reason you have to do that is um, if you run your pipeline in parallel, you uh, basically have to, um, if you run your, your pipeline in parallel, new R sessions will get started, and these new R sessions need to know right, about the packages. And so this is a way that targets knows how to tell these sessions, these new sessions, hey, these are the packages that you should load. If you load them here, you know, if I load this, if I load these packages like this, they will only be available inside of this session. So if I run my pipeline in parallel, the new sessions that will spawn have no idea about this, right? So that's why you should load them like this. Okay, so let's uh, run the pipeline. So how do I run the pipeline? I run tar make. Tar make builds the pipeline and uh, you know, downloads the data and it builds my targets and it tells me which targets it built and how, etc. You know. At the end I get some warnings, but that's not an issue. But if I look now, I have here an HTML file. <laughs> Sorry, I have here an HTML file, which is my output. And if I look at my output, right, uh, I, I see that I have my plots from before, okay, that I make. I have them now it is in this nice file. And maybe let's take a look at the RMD file. You see that the RMD file is very simple. It could be also be a quarto file if you want. It's the same thing. And I have this tar load calls, tar load, tar load. What does that do? It could even be tar read, actually, tar read, tar load. So let's go back to my targets. Let's say I want to look at flat data. Let's say I'm working on my pipeline and I want to, you know, I run my pipeline and it builds fine, but I want to look at flat data. I could run tar read, tar read, flat data, and this just reads the object and it just shows it to me, right? If, it, if you look at the environment, it's not, there's nothing there. But if I run tar load, flat data, now it's over here. It's, it gets loaded, and so I can take a look at it. I can continue working interactively with it, right? right? So that's very interesting. And this is basically what I do here. So here I just load or read the objects that I want to show, right? And that's it. And yeah, I make the plot, so I'm not going to, com to comment this, but basically instead of, of copy and pasting the, 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 the code five times to build the plots, I, I just you know, write this code that builds markdown code, and so it generates the plots for me automatically. Now, let's imagine, you know, let's go back, let's go back here. I have these plots. Let's imagine I don't want the plot for Mama anymore. I don't want this, right? Fine, I, I just go here, I remove it from the list, you know, and I save my script. Now let's let's take a look at the network. Sorry. Let's take a look at the network. So we see different colors. We see that the green, this means that these objects are up to date. And the blue, these are outdated. And why is analyzed data outdated? So what is analyzed data? Analyzed data is my report, okay? If I go here, I see that commune, which was this list that I changed, this is outdated. So I need to recompute that. And because I need to recompute that, I also need to recompute the report. But I don't need to recompute anything else. Anything else, did, you know, no, no other object got changed. So I don't need to change that. I just need here to recompute this, right? Uh, uh, my son. Hello. There's, sorry, there's my son in the room. Yes, you feel that? Still not in bed. 
the, the little little uh... <laughs> all right sorry about that so yeah the communes i changed the communes so because i changed the communes because i changed the communes i need to rerun my reports so basically if now i you know, rerun my pipeline if now i rerun my pipeline you will see something quite interesting you will see that everything that was okay you know was skipped right but only the target commune which i changed was rebuilt and my analysis was rebuilt so if i look now here you see that mama disappeared and so i only had to rerun that one thing okay i only had to rerun that and if i put another city here like uh, i don't know like uh, rodange you know this is another city and i save it you know and i i can now take a look again at, at my network i will have the same thing you know uh, i will have that commune is outdated over here and so if i if i rerun my pipeline down here if i rerun my pipeline as you see everything else gets skipped right and if i don't change anything if i don't change anything and I look at my pipeline. If I don't change anything, you see everything is green. Everything is updated. And so if I rerun my pipeline, all right, uh, if I rerun my pipeline, everything will get skipped. You see? And so this is very useful, again, because if I have this script-based workflows, I don't have this. Like each time I have to rerun my 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 script i have to rebuild everything and or, or i can save manually some intermediary objects but i have to do it manually you know this does everything automatically for me and so now let me just see if we have some question okay sorry about the uh <laughs> thank you yeah, the, the, my, my daughter is already in bed, but uh, the, the son uh, was not. So he won't say hi, I guess. Any some questions about targets? No questions. So hopefully my enthusiasm for, for targets was, uh, was shown to you because I think it's a really nice package. Like, and again, it forces you to write these functions. It w forces you to think of your analysis as a pipeline, which I really think is very useful. Um, so no questions. Very awesome. Thank you. Yeah, targets is great. I, I'm not the author, but I, I love it. I love this package. Yes, I hear something. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to you know open your mic or to write them. So. We have targets. Great. Let me just go back to. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is know? basically what. Uh, yes? We have a question. So, ah, yeah, yes. Before moving like to the next part. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, is targets. So, is a tar vis network defined by your target? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, like, if I, if I change, if I. You know, I don't know if I add a new target. Let me just like um, tar target, and I say like okay, I call it head data, and I say it's the head of flat data, for example. So it's not a very useful target, but uh, let me just show you. If I rerun my my network, I should see it here somewhere. Yeah, here it is. So this is head data. Here it is as a new object that will be an output of flat data, right? Um, and it's outdated because I haven't computed it yet. So if now I rerun, uh, if I rebuild this, right? Uh, now, you know, it, as you see, it will get built. And if I want to look at it, I can tar read add data. And now here it is. So I can call these objects. And where are these objects saved, saved by the way? So it's also, if they're saved in this folder, okay? So they are, they are here. In this folder, so these are these are all the targets. As you see, they are saved there. So if I turn off my computer, I turn off R, my computer explodes, whatever. 
if I have saved this, you know, if I use GitHub or whatever, I can I can just I don't need to recompute them. I can just get them again, right? I will, for example, if I clone I clone this repository, right? And I you know I just get I just get my my objects back, and I don't need to recompute them. And this is huge. This is like I cannot stress how useful targets is. It's amazing. It's really an amazing package. So I highly recommend that you that you take a look at it. And it may seem a bit restrictive because you do have to use these functions. You have to structure your code in a way that uh, you know it's just a series of function calls. But this is really very useful, and it makes actually your life much easier because now that I have these functions, you know, I can package them very easily because I can package them very easily. I can test them. I can document them very easily. Um, it's it's very nice. I can very easily reuse them because you know they're they're functions. So if I need to reuse them, I can reuse them. Uh, new new users, right? New users of my pipeline, future users, they will, I think, be much happier if they read it like this, or if they read than reading a script. Because they, as I as I showed you, they can start by reading the targets. They can take a look at the network. And then if they're interested and see, hey, how does get current communes work? Then they can choose to look at get current communes and they don't get overwhelmed, you know, by all of this code that gets dumped on them at all at once if you use scripts, right? Um, yes, so is it suitable to use targets with shiny and shiny models? Uh, so no, so targets is really, um, you know, you run your pipeline, it builds an output, and um, it's not really something that you can, you know, combine with, with um, like with Shiny. It's not something that you you can do. What you can do, uh, so this is also what I do, is I actually use targets to build the data, right? So the output will be uh, cleaned data, and then this data, I will use it inside of my Shiny app. So basically, what I will do is I will uh, I will like take basically this folder right this folder with objects I will take that I will copy that to my server and then I will just you know tell my shiny app hey load this and load that because these things actually are RDS objects so you can read them also with read RDS if you want these are just RDS objects and so that's what I do um, sometimes so I, I just you know so I build the clean data and then I read, you know, my clean data in the shiny app like this. But it, but you can't like run the app from targets. That this you cannot do, or not as far as I know, and I don't really see how it would work, uh, to be honest. Uh, yeah. So so yeah, it's easier than than using make files, definitely. So uh, make is a tool from the Unix uh, ecosystem that is, you know. Uh, very uh, established that you can use to build uh, pipelines as well, or even you know more generally speaking, any type of software. Um, and um, what is interesting with Make is that Make uh, is uh, language agnostic, so you can have certain targets in Make that are from R, or the targets are from Python, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you could do something like that that is you know multi-language. But if you're just working with uh, with R, you know then you know targets is much easier and um, and I, I yeah I highly recommend you use targets or some other build automation tool but targets I think is really really the easiest and most user friendly if you are an R user which should be the case of all of us I guess all right uh, yeah so dependencies of the pipeline so this I talked about how to inspect the pipeline how to run this I, I did, and you know, all, only the old targets get recomputed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, yeah, our analysis of the pipeline. So I think, yeah, I basically uh, and discussed all of this already. So you know, you have everything in the slides. Uh, yeah. So the pipeline is pure. So which means that the results don't depend on any extra manipulation from outside and. The pipeline itself does not change anything outside of it. It just adds this new product, this new file, like the, the, the markdown file that I compiled, and that's it. Like there's nothing else happening, and this is quite useful for reproducibility. Um, so it compiles a document. The computations can be run in parallel as well. So I'm not showing it here, but because targets detect which parts of the pipeline 
are independent, uh, it can very easily run them, right? And so our analysis is a pipeline. So yeah, so we have a pipeline, but what else is missing? Well, Orenv, you know, we, we haven't called Orenv. So basically, once I'm here and once I'm done, you know, I can run Orenv in it. And, you know, at least I get this Orenv, I get this Orenv log file. Uh, so apparently it already has one. Oh yeah, here it is. So this already has one, uh, but if it didn't, I could have generated it. So, so in this case, I will I will abort, right? Uh, because it already has one. So this is like the original RNV log file that was used for this project. So basically, what you know I can do is if I put this on GitHub, for example, or if I share it with my coworkers, my coworkers not only will be able to regenerate the library. So they get this RNV log file that they can use RNV restore, right? They can use RNV restore to get the packages and they can do that. And actually here they are, I guess, you know, I oh, know. So this is just, I haven't, I haven't run it. Uh, I haven't run RNV restore here, but that's fine. They could do it. And then they have the targets R. They can start by reading this. And then if they want more de details, they can go, you know, into the details, into the weeds and they can run the pipeline if they make sure that they get that they are using the same version of R, which is this version, which is not the version I'm using here. So I'm using R43.1. And this you know was made on an older version of R. But yeah, it doesn't have an impact, but it could have, right? Um, and if they are able to restore the R packages, they get, you know, they get the packages as well. All right. So we have a pipeline. And we are able to install packages, but we still have to deal with R itself. Um, no questions. So we still have to deal with R because our pipeline here is not 100% reproducible. We're not dealing with R yet. Okay, so we have to deal with that, and this is coming now. So remember the initial problem: it works on my machine, right? The code, the pipeline, it runs, it works on my machine. So turns out that we will actually ship the computer to solve this issue using Docker. So of course, we're not going to ship like the physical computer, but we're going to build a so-called Docker image. And this will be a, an image, a reflection, if you want, of our computer. So Docker is a containerization tool. It's, so it's something that you install on your computer. And it allows you to build images. And so as I said, an image is a, like a reflection of your computer, basically, uh, if you want. And out of these images, you can run as many containers as you want. And a container is basically an instantiation of an image. It's, it's you know, a running instance of an image, OK? So Docker images contain all the software and code you need for your project, and even the data if you want. You can add the data as well, OK? Or you can add the data at runtime only if you want. They are immutable, so which means that you can add stuff. So as you're running the container, you can change it. But once you turn off the container, every change will disappear. And if you rerun a new container, all the changes you did will be lost. OK, so it's immutable. And you can share them off and online. So you can share them through uh, a Docker registry called Docker Hub. Uh, or you can you know, save them as a file that you can give to people. And they can use that to run containers, right? So a word of warning, uh, so Docker works best on Linux and Mac OS, in my experience. Uh, but you know, I, I, maybe you know, there's always updates, so maybe the latest versions work well on Windows as well. Uh, as far as I know, you need, if you want to work with Docker on Windows, you need to enable some options in the BIOS, and you need to use WSL2. But again, maybe I'm not, this is not the freshest, freshest data on Docker, so maybe this changed already. So if, if you're using Windows, read the documentation. Probably, maybe it's easier now. Um, so I will try to provide a very gentle intro, but you know, Docker is not a very easy tool to get into, right? It's um, it's not that easy. But you know, I will try to really do it as gently as possible. Um, and again, there are more details in the book, and there are you know many, many, many resources that you can read. But you know, it takes some time to get into, of course. So let's start with an Hello Docker. So if you look at um, if you look at over here, you have 
the uh, Docker folder and you have a hello Docker and this hello Docker contains a Docker file. Okay, let's take a look at this Docker file. So a Docker file is basically the recipe, if you want, that we can use to build. The, it's it's a recipe that we can use to build an uh, an image. Okay, so here it's very easy. It just uses as a base the latest version of Ubuntu. So for those of you that don't know, Ubuntu is a uh, Linux-based operating system. So this is a very classical base to, that gets used for Docker images. It's not the only one. Debian is another popular choice. But Ubuntu is really a very popular choice. And it's also something that you can actually, it's an operating system that you can actually run on your computer as well. You can install it you know, and have an interface, and you can you know, use it on your computer. But it gets used for Docker. And then there's this command that is nothing but a, a, a bash uh, command that will print hello from Docker. That's it. So if I, if I run an, a container from this image, OK, I just get hello from Docker. That's it. And now I will uh, need to do something live, which is opening my terminal. And uh, yeah, here we are, because I need to, to, sh to show you on my actual computer. Let me zoom in. Uh, so yeah, here I have I am not in the right folder. Yeah, so here I am on my actual computer. And uh, okay, so where is oh yeah, if if I show you the Docker file, so you see the, here's the Docker file. Okay, so this is on my actual computer now. Okay, so I'm not actually this thing here. This R Studio, actually, this is running inside of my web browser. Okay, this is my web browser. This is Firefox. And this is running from a Docker container, actually. So you can even run like these web applications from Docker. So this is actually uh, a, a Docker container that contains our studio that I'm using for this presentation. Okay, uh, but but now I'm on my actual computer, and so I have this Docker file. Okay, I have this Docker file over here, and we can look at the contents, and it's the same as in you know as I showed you. And so basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to build this now. So I'm going to build this Docker image. So to build the Docker image, let me just zoom out now or zoom in again. Mm, yeah, this is the command that I ran to build the Docker image. So this Docker build command will look at the Docker file and will follow the instructions to build an image. And the image, now I, I, like I don't see it. Like it's not a file that I can see it. If I, if I want to save it as a file, I need to use another command. So I don't see anything over here. You know, I don't see anything. There's still just my Docker file. But basically, the image now got loaded like into the Docker, my internal Docker registry. And so now I can run, I can use Docker run to, uh, to, yeah, here it is. And I get my hello from Docker. So now I use Docker run. And what did I do? I run the hello container. So I called it hello container. I run the hello container from the hello image. OK, so let me tell you again. First of all, I build an image. OK, hello Docker. And then I run, and actually, I should rename this because this is not hello, but hello doc. So I have both. I have hello and hello docker, but it's the same thing. So now I run my container, and the container is called hello container, and it's an instance of the image called hello docker. OK? And I get my hello from docker. So this hello from docker did not actually run on my computer. It's run inside that container. I think I'm going to sneeze, but it's fine. So it's actually running from that container. Okay. So first thing, I build my image like this. Okay. And so the dot means look at the Docker file in this folder. So I build my image and I call it hello Docker. And then I run a container from this image, which I call hello container. And you know, I choose my image hello Docker. Okay. So these are the very, very first steps. So let me just take a look. Do we have some questions? And I will take the opportunity to.
Sorry about that. I know it's not very appetizing, but uh, no. Uh, no questions about Docker for now. Okay, great. So, you know, you have a Docker file, which is some kind of recipe. You build an image from this recipe, and then you run a container from this image. And this is what I did just now with this hello example, okay, from my computer. Let's go back to the presentation. So basically, this is everything, you know, that I showed you. You have all the code. You can, you know, if you didn't get everything, not a problem. You can run everything. All the code is there. Um, the RM option just means, you know, just remove the container after running. So this is, you know, not super important for our purposes. But basically, if you run a container and you don't put RM, the container is kind of staying. Even if it doesn't do anything, it's just staying there and running, even if it's not running anything, but it's like just there. And so RM, I say, okay, once you've done running the command, just just disappear, basically. Okay. So that's what RM does. And the name, some name. So this is just to give my container a name. Because again, remember, I can run as many containers as I want. Uh, I just need to name them differently. OK. So if I run my pipeline without Docker, this is what happens. I have my, my pipeline, I have my source code, and I'm running my pipeline on an operate, on a certain operating system on this version of R, and I get an output. If I now take the same pipeline with the same source code, but I run it on a different operating system and on a different version of R, I get a different output. So you see the output is slightly different. It's a star that is slightly different, this one. OK, this one has like eight uh, beaks, and this one has seven or something like that. So it's it's a bit different, OK? But with, can, with Docker, basically my pipeline and my source code, they are not running, per se, on that operating system. They're not running on, on the operating system Z with this version. They're running on Ubuntu 22.04 with this version of R. And what is really important to understand is that my Docker image here, this is Ubuntu, right? So this is this Linux operating system, but I can run it on Windows or on Mac OS or on, even on another Linux distribution. So for example, this, you know, this what I showed you, uh, my computer here, this it's uh, an open SUSE Linux distribution, but I'm running containers with uh, Ubuntu and with Debian, etc. Uh, I have another laptop that is running uh, a Windows for work. There I, I can run, you know, Linux containers. I have uh, two Raspberry Pis that are running some Ubuntu, but I can run containers that are, uh, you know, on Debian or whatever. It doesn't matter. So this means that with my Docker container or my Docker images, I get a fixed operating system. This is never going to change. And a fixed version of R because I can install the version of R that I want. And it's going to be that version forever. And it will run in completely independently of the one that is already on my computer. Do we have questions? Yeah, so basically, in a sense, yeah, exactly. So without the RM option from the Docker run uh, thing, basically, you, you have some kind of zombie processes in a sense, yeah. It's just, you know, the container is there. It's blocking like like the name, right? Uh, so you cannot run another container with the same name, and it's not doing anything. So it's, yeah, essentially like a zombie process, basically. Yeah, that's right. That's a good way of looking at it. All right. So how do we dockerize a project? So we're going to do it in two steps. So we're going to build an image. So in this built image time, we're going to install the right version of R, or we are going to use an image that already comes with a version of R. I'm going to explain that. We are going to install packages using our R and vlog file. We are going to copy all the scripts from our project to the image itself. And we are going to run the analysis using target star make. So this will all happen when we will build our image. And when we will run a container, the only thing that will happen is that we're going to copy the outputs of the analysis from the container to the computer. Because what you need to understand is when I build my image and all of this happens, target star make is going to run and the outputs basically, this, uh, if I go back to my pipeline, my, my, my HTML file, it's going to be inside of the container. Okay, So this is going to be there as an output. And so what I need to do to get it from the container to my computer, I, I, I need to copy the outputs of the analysis 
from the container to the computer. Remember that I told you that um, you know Docker containers they are isolated from your computer, but there is a way to create a shared folder, and this shared folder, which is called a volume, okay, this shared folder, this volume, will you can use it to transfer data from the container to your computer or vice versa, from your computer to the container. So this is also a way that you can do, for example, if you don't want to put the data inside of the container, right? If it's sensitive data, what you can do is, you know, you you just provide the data at runtime, right? And, uh, and so that's what we're going to do, but in the reverse. So basically we're going to get the output from the container to our computer. Okay, I'm going to show you that, of course. Um, so the built image can be shared, you know, online, or you can also only share the Docker file and all the images required, uh, the, the scripts required, and I'm going to explain to you. Uh, the outputs will always be the same, and um, and so it's going to be reproducible. So it's important to really understand the difference between build and runtime. At build time, uh, my software, my packages, my dependencies, everything gets installed and run using run statements. And uh, you know, I must ensure that the correct versions get installed, you know, of the software using RN, etc. And at runtime, the last command that starts with CMD gets executed. And I'm going to show you how how this looks like. So let me go. So if this is our Docker Dockerized project, so it's the same pipeline. It's exactly the same pipeline, but now I have a Docker file. And this Docker file, as you see, it's much more complex. But for now, let's just look at what is here uh, below. So I have all these run statements. So what these run statements do is, for example, here it installs the RN package, okay, using run, run R E. So run this expression in R. I build directories using the mkdir command. So these are Linux commands because remember, we are inside Ubuntu basically. And so if you are familiar with Linux, this will be very easy to understand. If you are not familiar with Linux, this will be a bit more complicated. But basically here we are building the folders that we need to uh, you know, contain our project files. So here I have the housing. Here I have, to, you know, this is going to hold my pipeline output. This is you know, going to be the shared folder. Here I copy now the rnvlog file, which is here. I copy this file inside this path in my container. I do the same with the functions folder over here. I do the same with the analyze rmd and the targets.r. And then I run this line, which as you see, will set the working directory to the right path. And I will run rnv init and rnv restore. And this will download all the packages inside my container. And then I'm going to go to this directory using CD. So basically it's like set working directory in, in, in R and I run my pipeline now. And this, all of this, all these things, this will happen when I build my image. And this last thing, this last command will just move the outputs. All the outputs will move from here to the shared folder. So I will get them into my computer, okay? Now, let's go back to the top. I don't use Ubuntu anymore. I use these Rocker uh, images. And let's take a look. So I, I should have the... Um, so the Rocker project is... Um, the Rocker project is a project that contains pre-built images for R that already come with a specific version of R. Okay, so if I go to Rocker project... If I go over here, I have all these images that I can run. So for example, this line here will run an RStudio instance like the one I'm, I'm, I'm running right now. And here I have this versions. Let me zoom in. I have these R versions, okay? So these are images that I can use and this will come with R version 4.0 or in my case over here with R version 4.0. Point three point zero, okay? And these are, I think, built on, I don't know if it's Ubuntu or Debian, but it doesn't really matter. Maybe it's Ubuntu, uh, but Ubuntu and Debian are very similar. So that's why, you know, I, I, 
I don't remember, but it's basically, you know, for our purposes, basically the same. And this is running, uh, this image comes with already R pre-installed, right? So I don't need to install R, my, R myself. I can just use that. And as you see, there are, oops, sorry. As you see, there are, you know, many, many versions. There are versions that, that are, you know, purpose made for Shiny, purpose made for machine learning we, and uh, AI with CUDA. Uh, there are versions that come uh, with Tidyverse already, with geospatial libraries. So there are many, many things that come, you know, pre-built that you can use, right? And the way to use that is just to say, well, I want to build my image on top of this one. And what you see over here, so this is a bit complex, but these are basically the, the development libraries that I need for uh, installing all the packages that I require. And how did I get this list? So for this, I need to show you something else. How did I get that? From the posit package manager. And here you have, a, if you don't know this, this is very interesting. Let me show you, for example, if I go to dplyr, uh, I get this, you know, I can install dplyr, right? And if I go, okay, what? Uh, I think it's frozen. Yeah, the website, okay, now it's, okay. Eh? It's setup should, Ooh, uh, okay. So now it seems to be working, it was frozen. So if I click on setup, okay, and if I choose Ubuntu 2204, okay? So this is like the latest uh, long-term support release. So I, 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 I get now this list basically of all the system dependencies that I need to install to make sure that my packages get installed properly. And if I go back to dplyr now, so I chose Ubuntu, I go back to dplyr, I should, where's my mouse? So the website is very laggy. Do, do you still hear me? Because my web, my browser is frozen. Yes. Are oh, you still hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, oh yeah, now it's working. Okay. So in the case of dplyr, there are no known prerequisites. But if I go to a package like rgdal, I think it's this one. Okay. So it's archived now. Um, yeah. So uh, this one now is archived. Uh, so it's not a good one. Uh, uh, which one could I use as an example? Uh, let me see my pipeline again. Um, what do I install? Ah, oh, mass. Mass probably needs something. So let's go to mass. Uh, oh, no known prerequisites. That's interesting. I guess mass should have some. Uh, I cannot find now an example to show you. So this is a bit, oh yeah, tidier as one. Okay. So as you see, uh, where is it? Yeah. As you see, tidier needs this on Ubuntu. Okay. So if I, if your pipeline has tidier, you need to install this development library. And I think I do actually, if I look back to my Docker file, it should be listed somewhere probably. Or maybe not. Maybe I don't need it, so it's not there. Maybe I don't. Okay. But in any case, I ha I've had a lot of success with this. So this is a bit complex. But if you're building Docker images, maybe you know just copy and paste this, then you should be fine. And also, as I told you, R and they are working right now on you know integrating PAC with it, and so PAC should take care of this for you in the future. So it will make things easier. Okay. I have my base image that ships the right version of Ubuntu. I have my dependencies and I agree, if you don't use Ubuntu, if you don't use Linux, this may seem very complex, but all the code is available, just use that, you know, and if, if you get an error message because a package cannot be installed, you can usually find help relatively easily, you know, if you Google and the Stack Overflow or even ChatGPT sometimes can, can help with that. And sometimes even the error message itself tells you, hey, you actually need to install this thing, you know, so, so read the error message as well. And, you know, and then you can run the pipeline, you know, you build all the folders that you need, you copy all the files that you need, and you, you run all the commands that you need. And this is always the same structure. So you can really just reuse this structure for all of your pipelines. Um, let me just see if I, oh yeah, uh, maybe I can talk about 
Docker Hub before. Let me just, yeah. So Docker Hub, uh, so you don't necessarily need to use it, but basically Docker Hub is a website. Oh yeah, so now I don't have my, uh, my login, so I don't know because I'm on a fresh browser, but basically if you go to Docker Hub, all right, if you Google Docker Hub, maybe let me just Google it, you can find uh, images on there. So it's basically like a GitHub for, for images. So maybe let's let's see the uh, this image. So this is an image for Nginx, okay, uh, which is I think a, like a web server, but you know, I could go now here and probably just type Rocker and I think I should go, oh no, maybe I need to, to Google it then. Yeah, here it is. So, for example, this, these are the um, these are all the images. They're here uh, for for the R Studio stable uh, family of images. And so, basically, when you write this thing here, the images get downloaded from Docker Hub. Okay, they get downloaded from here, and you can also have your own Docker Hub and put your own images there. So I actually, I have one, for example, and you can find some of the images that, I, that I've that i used in the past and that I continue to use sometimes. Uh, and you can, you know, just start from Bruno, blah, 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 and you get my images, okay? And you can use them. And it's the same here for, uh, it's, it's the same here for, for Rocker. So that's, and you, you know, you can upload your, your images and you can download them from there, etc. Uh, so you, you can also share images without a registry. So if you if they contain like confi confidential data or code or whatever, you can just like put them on a USB stick, for example, and just share them like this. So this works as well. This is all explained in the book, by the way. So here I cannot show you everything, uh, but you know in the book there's all the details uh, that you can read. So let's finally look at our project. So let me go back to my computer. So what do I have? I have my RMD file. I have a Docker file. I have my functions. I have here. I have targets. I have everything. Okay. So what? first of all, I can build. I need to build my image, right? So I'm going to build it with this command. So now it's going to, so this is the command, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to call my image wraps rug Tunis. As you see, Everything has been cached because I've built this image yesterday in preparation for today. So everything is cached, nothing happens. Okay, but if you run this for the first time, of course, you know, it will take some time because it needs to install everything. Okay, but now, you know, I've built my image. So now I should be able to run a container from my image. But remember, I want to get what was computed. Okay, I want to get... These, um, these outputs, which you don't see here, but if I go back here, I want to get this HTML file. So this HTML file got computed and, it, and it's inside of my image, okay? It got computed because I ran target star make, okay? So it's there, so I need to take it. And remember, I built this shared folder. So I need to use this shared folder to create, if you want, like a tunnel be between my computer and the Docker container that I'm going to run. And so the way to do that is I'm going to run, I'm going to run, here it is. I'm going to run, and it's going to be a bit complicated. I'm going to run, and I'm going to call it housing container. Uh, yeah, well, it's called housing because it's a project about housing, but whatever. This is just the name of my container. And now I'm going to use the V option to mount the volume. And so this is the path on my computer, okay? So this is the path here on my computer. And this is the path inside of the uh, container, okay? So this is the path of the inside of the container. Look at, here it is, it's exactly the same, okay? And I'm going to say, okay, I want my folder here to be linked to this folder, and I want read and write permissions, okay? And this container that I'm going to run, I'm going to run it from the housing image, okay? Because this the housing image is the actual image that I want to run. So I run this, 
and it's going to run very quickly because it's just copying stuff from the container to my computer. So now let's go. Let's go here. Okay. No such file directory. Okay. So that's, oh yeah, I know why. I know why. Uh, here we are. So here it is. Here's the file that I computed. And of course I can remove it, remove it. Okay, so now I have nothing. So the folder is empty. And what I can do is I can run my container again. So now I run my container. And now here it is again. You know, And why does it have the date of yesterday? Because I told you, I built this yesterday. So this is when I ran the code yesterday. So this is the time it was created inside the container. And because the container is cached, right? Because I, I built it yesterday and I didn't change anything, I get my you know, I get it with the date of when it was actually built. And now it's inside my uh, you know it's it's, it's inside my uh, my computer and I can open it using Firefox and here it is. Here it is and at the end, I added an R session file. You see, it's run. It ran on Ubuntu. It ran on this version of R, and uh, it ran with all of these packages. And I can run this in ten years, and it's going to be exactly the same output. Exactly the same output. All right. And if I change something somewhere and I rerun it, I am sure that the changes in my results will only be due to my changes because everything is frozen. The R version is frozen, the packages are frozen, everything is frozen. So um, so that, you know, that's how, oh yeah, these things I explained, you know, what does the first line do? Yeah, uh, this is basically what I explained. So again, I run the Docker file, I have a targets file, a log file, uh, you know, the source to our analysis, etc., etc. So this is basically everything that I did with the commands as well, so you can try it at home. Okay, so you, you can try everything, and uh, that's it. So just you know, one word of conclusion, and then we can take some time for some questions. Is Docker Panacea? Uh, it's very widely used. Uh, it's very popular. It's a very popular solution. But the entry cost is high. Like I, I know that it's not easy. If you have zero experience with Linux, it can be a bit complicated. Um, it's also a single point of failure. You know, what happens if Docker gets abandoned or bought or whatever, you know? You never know. Um, so there are some alternatives. Podman, for example. There's also something, a tool I, I, I like very much, but I didn't talk about it today, which is called Nix, uh, which is a, a tool that allows you to build reproducible pipelines without containerization. I'm working uh, a lot with, with Nix now. I, I really enjoy it. I already wrote some blog posts on it, etc. I made some videos about it. So if you're curious, you can take a look. Um, and in conclusion, so at the very least, at the very least, generate an RM vlog file. I, it's very easy, and it can help people, uh, you know, rerun your projects. It's always possible to rebuild a Docker image from that RM vlog file in the future. Consider also using targets because I think it's you know very good for reproducibility, but it's also just an amazing tool, right? So, I think even if you're just adopting targets, even just to make your life easier, it's definitely worth it. Uh, even if it's not your end goal, is not reproducibility. In terms of long-term reproducibility, there's really no other alternative than either using Docker or Nix or something like that. Like, and there, and then some you know learning curve and maintenance effort is required. Like, there's really no way about it. There is no easy solution. Uh, some people use virtual machines for that as well, but that's you know, not easy to manage either. So, just have to use something like <laughs> like a virtual machine or Docker. So in the end, you know, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, and uh, you know, we 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 put the the, the links to the GitHub etc. on the chat. If you can also open an issue there if you want to contact me. Um, so yeah, I I hope that you enjoyed, and we still have a little bit of time for questions. So you know, if you do have some questions, don't hesitate. Thanks. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you so much. So please, can you put in the chat if you have like questions or 
if you want to share some thought about Docker or like targets or what we saw today. So please. Yeah, actually we are recording this session. So you will get uh, an email with the link, you know, of the recording and the link to our YouTube channel because it will be posted on our YouTube channel. Yeah, so yeah, the the the, the um so just answering to the la la last comment there, yes, so the, the the entry cost is high, yeah, definitely. Like the it's it, the, there's really no 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 there's really not like a shortcut, you just have to learn it. But it's really it's very useful. Because what you can also do with Docker is that you can, for example, Dockerize a Shiny app. Uh, and then, you know, instead, uh, and so your Shiny app will contain, for example, the Shiny server, all the dependencies and everything. And then deploying the Shiny app actually is the problem gets transformed into just uh, running a container. So, and you can run a container relatively easy, right? Uh, and it can be much easier to uh, run a container from, um, from a shiny app than actually running a shiny app on a real server, you know that you need you need to install shiny server on it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's that's quite uh, that's quite useful, and um, and yeah, and for pipelines as well because the pipeline then you have everything self-contained, you know, and you can run it uh, as you want. You can run it on GitHub Actions as well. This is also something I discuss in the book. So you can on GitHub Actions whenever you push, for example, changes to your pipeline or to Docker file, a new container gets built gets pushed automatically to Docker Hub. And uh, uh, so an image gets built, sorry, and a container gets run. And you get the output inside of GitHub. Uh, GitHub. So your, your outputs get also available uh, from GitHub. So that's quite useful as well. Do we have other questions? Again, you have the slides, you have my contacts. Uh, should you have any questions later on? Oh yeah, so you know, GitHub Actions plus Docker is, is quite, uh, quite nice. You, even just GitHub Actions without Docker is also quite useful as well. Uh, and you know, it automates a lot of, you can just work on your pipeline and you, you push, you push, you push, and each time you get your outputs. So it's really nice. You're welcome, everyone, <laughs> for all the people thanking me. Thank you also for joining. So suggestions on resources on Docker. Well, you know, there's uh, there's uh, there, there's my book <laughs> that you can read. It's free. Uh, I have a chapter on Docker, uh, which is focused, of course, on uh, reproducible pipelines. Uh, but if you want, like, to use Docker for 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 Shiny or whatever. There's a lot of blog posts, a lot of, of uh, yeah, I mean, blog posts from the community, a lot of examples as well. Um, so, I mean, there's already a lot of things out there that you can just Google. Um, I don't have like a specific example now of a book or whatever that you could read, but it's also a lot of trial and error. Like, try to try to do something and and try to learn from experience. At least this is how I learned Docker. It was really from experience and from reading blog posts. Um, but yeah, I mean, read my book. <laughs> There's some stuff in there that you that you can use uh, immediately, even though it's focused on pipelines. Um, so you know, everyone, you're welcome. <laughs> no problem. If you have other questions, you know, don't hesitate. Yeah, please go ahead and ask and or share your thought about, yeah, if you want, like, to learn about something or resources or whatever. As I said, so uh, we will send you by next week the link to the recording and we will post uh, this uh, workshop on our YouTube channel. Great. Uh, could you get more info about your book? Well, I mean, you can. Uh, so if you if you go, let me put the link. I will put the link in the chat. One second. Uh, if you go to this website that is here, you can read the book for free. Uh, and 
and uh, you can you know also buy it if you want but you don't have to you can it's free and it, again the content is exactly the same um and the the book really walks you through basically the two hours that i gave you today the book goes into much 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 more detail um and it goes really from you have your scripts and how do you build a reproducible pipeline with docker with github actions with unit tests with uh, packages etc cetera, etc cetera. so you learn about packaging you learn about functional programming etc so you have like it goes into much much more more detail than what i did today but it's you know the same message basically Okay, so if there are no more questions, thank you so much, Bruno, for spending your Sunday, uh, your Saturday with us, sorry. No, no and, problem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> because actually it's uh, yeah Saturday night for you. So thank yes. you. Thank you so much yeah, for your time, for this amazing uh, workshop and uh, for accepting our invitation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being with us and for joining our workshop. And please, uh, we will send you, yeah, we will be for next year uh, also like organizing other workshops. So feel free to ask if you are interested in any like, yeah, it's like subject or if you want to learn something new. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Bruno. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, and thank you, everyone. Thank you for being with us and for asking so many interesting questions. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Thank bye bye. You. Have Thanks. a nice weekend. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.